Hello everybody, welcome to Rootopsy, Modern Routing Protocol Vulnerability Analysis and Exploitation. I'm Tyron Kemp and I work with this project um, along with Simon Zhukovsky. Um, at the time we were both pen testers at SensePost. Simon is a lead axor, um, he likes AppSec and writing code. I'm a bit of scrub. Um, unfortunately, um, Simon can't join us for this one, so he's stuck with me. Um, I have some networking, network security experience, and I've done some pen testing, and um, how to sort of just give you some background, how the project came about. Um, I think it was a SenseCon, myself and Simon wanted to do something, and um, he wanted to learn about some networking stuff, and I wanted to learn how to write better code. I think Simon learned some networking, and I still write really bad code. But here we are, um, and we want to show you how to identify um, some of these network related vulnerabilities, how our initial attempt looked at attacking some of them, um, what what was the impact of, the, of, of thereof and what are the challenges that uh, we faced and that you may face and how the toolkit attempts to overcome some of those challenges. So um, we went on some pen tests and on reoccurring occasions we saw these vulnerable um, TRP and FHRP protocols being multicasted into user space which they shouldn't be. So um, maybe our initial idea was to build this toolkit that would attack any network related protocol and that would be cool um, but for now we're focusing on these two things and we'll, we'll go into them and explain them a little bit better and what the differences are etc etc. In the DRP stack we're going to focus on EIGRP and OSPF and then in the FHRP stack we're going to focus on um, HSRP. So, um, I realize that they sound the same and it's a bunch of acronyms coming your way, but just try and keep that in the back of your mind and you should be okay. Um, why are we doing this? Uh, we saw this in multiple different environments, not being bound to any sort of sort of uh, same topology or industry or anything. We were seeing them across the plethora of different customers. Um, also, dynamic reading protocols are being are being used in Kubernetes. Um, they use these things called CNIs, Container Network Interfaces. I think is the correct acronym. Um, and you can see on the slideshow it mentions Calico and Ramana. Calico is uses BGP and Ramana uses OSPF. Uh, Simon did most of the work on the Kubernetes stuff. I think I showed him sort of some BGP stuff and then he ran with it um, to get some ponage. Um, some of that's been taken out of this presentation because uh, it's just really more Simon's work. Um, but before we get into DRPs and FHRPs, let's explain what a static route is. So uh, for us to route traffic from the 10 network to the 40 network, we need to add a static route from A to B, from B to C, from C to B and B to A. Uh, and that's obviously not a great process. It's quite tedious and um, manual. So now you move over to a, a network or a company with 100 routers and 1,000 networks. Imagine having to configure a static route for each, um, for each network to get to each other network. And you need to take care of um, redundancy as well. You know, so you, in the, that's sort of what I tried to depict in the middle of that image. Um, you might configure um, two routes between the same networks on different on different links. So if the one link drops, the, your second static route with a less or higher priority will take over. It's not very um, feasible. So you know, luckily we have these things called dynamic routing protocols. Um, like I said, we're going to focus on OSPF and EIGRP. So what you would do is you would hop onto that router and you configure the protocol with its parameters on each router, and it would automatically share the routing and networking information, and it would. Would automatically based on its own algorithm connect which is um, auto, uh, determine which is the best path between the networks and then if that link drops uh, the redundant path would automatically kick in. Um, uh, FHRPs uh, it's more of a high, high availability mechanism so um, you can see the user A um, by default uses the user A's traffic traverses through that switch and then it goes through that active router. So that active and standby router form part of sort of a, a logical group within um, uh, HSRP or, F or VRRP, and there's a priority assigned to it. Um, and then once the one fails over, there's also, a, there's also a virtual MAC address assigned to this group and a priority, 
So if the active device um, were to fail, then that virtual MAC address would just switch to the, the other device and the user's traffic would get routed without um, knowing uh, anything had happened on the network. Okay, so how do you look for these things um, in terms of EIGRP? Um, I think I mentioned multicast earlier. So you can see in the packet capture at the top there, it's going to a 224 address. So many of these attacks are because things are getting multicasted um, into networks that, that, that it shouldn't. Um, but to get into uh, more EIGRP specific stuff, um, in this packet, the only thing we really need to look out for is the autonomous system number. And that's all these parameters you need to take, um, take note of and you just need to configure it on your attacker um, or rogue router type of thing. So in that instance of EIGRP, we didn't see that there was any authentication um, present. So it's pretty simple. You take that info out of the PCAP um, and you build your config and you attack or join the routing process. But um, it is possible to add authentication to these things. So there's two variants. There's the clear text, um, clear text auth, which is not that great because you can just observe it as well. Um, and then there's a, a sort of hashed alternative, um, but it's not also it's not game over when um, there's crypto applied. You can get the hash for certain algorithms using Ethercap, and then you can crack it uh, with John Roper. And um, often these things are configured with passwords um, like password or key or Cisco. So if you go onto like how to configure Cisco. OSPF authentication, you know, the guides are always using sort of a weak password, so you can try and guess it as well. Um, yeah, so if we look at this EIGRP packet, you can see there's some, um, some hashing applied to it. Um, there's no password or string or anything that we can observe there. Again, we can pause this thing to, to Ethercap uh, and we can try and crack the hash to join the routing process. If we look at a OSPF packet, there's a little bit more to consider. Um, as opposed to EIGRP, um, we have to take note of that area ID, quad zero, and then this is the, the plain text variant of auth that I spoke about. Um, so there's auth, but you, you know you can observe it in plain text, so it's not really useful. Um, and then we need to take care of, or take note of the hello interval and the dead interval. Okay, cool. So moving over to the FHRP stack, um, if we look at an HSRP packet, which is a Cisco proprietary protocol, um, the, you need to make sure that you're looking at the active uh, router's um, hello packet, not the standby, because you want to assign yourself a higher priority as the active. But if you're just higher than the standby device, you know, you're not going to become the active guy. So, um, you know, make sure you're looking at an active packet. Uh, you need to take note of the hello and the uh, hold time. Uh, those are sort of the default values. Um, so you'll often see them as 3 and 10. And then you can see on this router the priority is 150, so we just need to go up and we can become um, the active uh, active device. Uh, that logical grouping I was speaking of, this is for group 10, you'll need to take note of that. And then you can see here again there's the default um, plain text auth applied, um, not super useful, and then a virtual IP address uh, assigned to the group, uh, which you will, you will effectively become that virtual IP address once you attack the protocol. So how do these things creep into the network? Um, minimalist config is one way. So if you look at this config extract, you can see that um, that router would advertise OSPF hello packets on all its interfaces based on that quad zero that you're seeing. So you, you might see something like this, which is a little bit better. You know, it's saying slash 24 and slash 25, but that router may not have those interfaces. That router may have uh, like two slash 25s on that 10 network and then you might only want to speak OSPF on the one interface within that slash 24 but it's actually two slash 25s um, yeah you have to be very specific so you could have had like you could have um, configured OSPF on the interface or you could have said slash 32 to make sure that it only goes out of the the one the one interface that you wanted to go on and so these are the errors that that admins are making and that we can abuse um, again, in the in the Kubernetes world, um, you can see there. Um, this is a Ramona um, configure an example of a Ramona configuration, and you can see there's an asterisk in the interface field. So, 
if you're a Kubernetes admin, you might be dealing with a bunch of different OSs. Um, and we don't use S0 anymore. We have these funny ENS33, ENS123 numbers, and you know it's different between OS, uh, different between OSs. So you know it might be the easiest thing just to use a wildcard to make sure that your OSPF process comes up. But again, this minimalist config um, is an issue where you should really be strict with your config. You know, it's like configuring an ACL. You have got to be very specific. Okay, so we have a, a bit of an understanding of, of how these protocols um, work and how some of the volumes introduced. It's also important to know where they live within the network. So if we um, consider ourselves connected to a switch, um, uh, you might, you'd be likely to see an FHRP, something like um, HSRP providing you with that default, uh, redundant default gate we, we've seen in the previous slides. Um, if you manage to pivot or move um, throughout the network and you find yourself connected to a LAN where a router or a firewall is connected, um, it's likely that you'll see a, a DRP uh, being multicasted into that, into that uh, network or VLAN because that's what those devices speak. Um, routers and firewalls often make use of VRRP for high availability as well. So two firewalls connected together, they speak VRRP between each other. Uh, Sometimes that can be configured um, incorrectly as well, and we can take advantage of that. Lastly, uh, we mentioned Kubernetes, CNIs make use of dynamic routing protocols. So maybe if you end up in that router network and you uh, tamper with traffic, you may be able to uh, affect routing within Kubernetes, or maybe you've landed in the Kubernetes, um, somewhere in Kubernetes where you can uh, affect one of these CNIs, and you might be able to um, impact routing in the traditional network as well. Okay, so what's the impact of you know ex um, exploiting these vulnerabilities? Uh, well, consider yourself connected to a network, um, as indicated on the slide. Um, you know of some hosts on your network because you have an ARP table, and you uh, know about your default gateway probably as a result of DHCP. But now you start interfacing with either OSPF or, G or EIGRP, and you join the process and you learn of some new networks. So now you learn of the finance network and the server network, and you have some new targets. So that's pretty cool. Um, you know, you didn't have to go in map uh, quad slash eight or slash sixteen. You 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 learned with these things in a quite stealthy manner. Um, but we want to go a little bit further. We want to see if we can manipulate traffic flows. So there's a finance user connecting to an ERP server um, in the server network. And from our attacker's perspective, um, you know, we we know what that network is. So what we can do is we can um, inject a more specific route into the the routing process. And what will happen is that traffic will then be redirected towards us. Um, and you can imagine, you know, that redirecting ERP traffic towards your attacker machine could have some devastating impacts. For FHRPs, we mentioned there's this logical group with a virtual um, virtual IP address and a virtual MAC, uh, and there's a priority assigned, and the, the device with the highest priority um, is the active one, and traffic is routed towards that device. So, from an attacker's perspective, we give ourselves that higher priority. Traffic is uh, directed towards us, and we route that traffic um, upstream to the legitimate default gateway, essentially establishing a person in the middle attack. So, for DRPs, we need to get um, we need to get specific. And what we mean by that is, um, you need to try and inject a more specific route into the routing table, sort of to beat the routing table entry. If you add a slash twenty four uh, route on your machine and a slash twenty five you know the traffic's going to go towards the slash 25 that's just how routing works there's more specific stuff like protocol per protocol metrics or per protocol specific metrics um, and something called the administrative distance but for now just just know that you need to try and be more specific with your your routing entries to beat the routing table um, so how did we do this initially we were connected to a lan uh, we opened up wireshark exactly like we showed and we saw some unauthenticated um, EIGRP packets, I think it was, and we wanted to attack it. So, you know, we did some research. Is there any tooling available? Um, there was, but uh, it was easier for us to configure a virtual firewall, and that's sort of the route that we took. And I'll show you what that looked like. Um, so, on the left hand side, there's a Wireshark capture, and we see some OSPF hello packets. So, you should already get excited when you see that. Uh, you, you know, you shouldn't really see those things on, on a user network, regardless of whether there's auth or not. And then on the right hand side is our rogue attacker firewall. And we're just going to match the parameters on the left, configure the firewall, and we should join the routing process. So um, for OSPF, there's a couple of things that we need to take note of. 
look at the auth null, so this is going to be an easy attack. Um, we look at the area ID, quad zero, that's important to OSPF. We look at the hello and the dead interval, 10 and 40. So uh, with, with that knowledge, we're going to map that into the 40 gate. Um, so we're going to give ourselves a router ID, which is just the unique identifier within the process. We're going to add the area, which we know is quad zero now. And then we're going to say we want to speak OSPF out of uh, only one specific interface. We'll get this IP out of the URL bar, the only interface that this firewall has. And that's, you know, we are only sending hellos out of that one interface. And again, on the 40 gate, we need to add the interface, give it a name, specify the interface. And over here, we'll um, configure the hello and dead interval, which we got from the backer capture as well. So. On the left hand side now you should see an OSPF conversation happening. It shouldn't take too long. One, two, three, there we go. And we see some OSPF stuff happening over there. And in those LSU, LS update packets um, is where the routing information is shared. So on the right 40 gate you can see um, there's not much routes over there. Um, once we refresh the routing table or the routing monitor, you should see that we've learned a bunch of new networks. So that's pretty cool. Um, we haven't attacked anything really. We just joined the process, but now we have new targets to go after and that could be useful from an attacker's perspective as well. So what's the downside with this? Um, you, well, downside of this approach, you need to have access to firmware, like a 40 gate or something that's able to speak these protocols. Um, you need to have knowledge of the protocol. So you need to know how OSPF, EI, GRP or whatever works to attack it. Um, and sort of the old tools, um, we weren't, we weren't successful using the old tools to, act, to, to attack these protocols. So, what, so um, you know, we sort of just started, we started seeing a pattern, um, and the pattern was, you know, all you have to do here is pause a PCAP, extract some stuff, build a config template, map it to a router, and then boom, profit. So that's sort of how Rootopsy came about. And um, how do we build this thing? Well, we use Python, uh, we leverage Docker quite a bit, um, and then probably the most prominently used Docker container is something called FR Routing. Uh, it's an open source router, uh, similar to something like Quaha or Bird, um, but this one seemed quite nice and it, it, it suited our needs quite nicely. And that's sort of the comp composition of Rootopsy. Um, and Rootopsy was built um, using or using this sort of uh, scan attack and inject uh, methodology so you can scan for things so you don't have to open up wireshark you can just run scan and it will it will do the do the scanning and detection of uh, vulnerable uh, packets for you and then the attack uh, flag will join the routing process or, uh, and just do that sort of enumeration thing that we've showed you and then if you want to go one step further and you want to start injecting stuff you'll use the inject or redirect flag there's a couple of variants um, but there'll be some demos on that. But this is sort of the methodology, scan, attack, and then take it one step further. So go slowly and just do it step by step uh, until you get your ponage. Um, so um, learning new routes is cool, but it's much, cool, much cooler um, intercepting and redirecting traffic. So. So before we start with the demo, we're just going to orientate ourselves a little bit. There's quite a bit going on. On the top left, um, we have our attacker machines routing table. We're running a watch command over there. Um, and you can see there's not, much, not many routing table entries over there. On the top right, we have our uh, attacker machine again. And that's where we'll run our rootopsy commands. Um, so the top is attacker stuff. and the bottom, we have uh, a router we're going to attack and uh, which is, we can call the victim router and then at the bottom we have a victim doing some dns uh, queries and uh, generating some ftp traffic um, so at the top is attacking stuff at the bottom is is victim stuff so let's get into it um yeah like i mentioned just the routing table um we'll hop over to the other panes and explain them a little bit more in depth um, on the right hand side, root, rootopsy, and you can see there we've specified the scan flag. You can take note of the IP address, put it in the back of your mind, 170. Um, the root on the left um, has one, has two OSPF neighbors at this point in time, and that's the IP address for the router, is 76.208. After our attacks, um, you'll see that there will be three neighbors instead of two. Um, so nothing's happened yet, just yet. 
um, you know, there's the DNS query I was speaking about, um, and there's the FTP traffic. Um, we're going to open up Wireshark, and we're going to show you that you know there's no interception or redirection or anything like that happening at this point in time. And we'll start off with a scan command, and the scan command is just going to identify a, a vulnerability and build a config template, but it's not going to map that template. Um, so once it identifies the bomb, we'll have a look at the templates and just go through them. So we're looking at the um, EIGRP and OSPF config. Um, EIGRP one, we just had to um, pause the autonomous system number, number 100, like we saw earlier. Quite simple over here. Um, you could, if you wanted to, um, you know, go configure this on another route or something that you wanted to play with, um, and you would join this process. So let's look at OSPF. This one's a little bit more involved. Um, it has a, this hello and dead interval that we, we spoke of as well. And then um, the network statement is just our interface again, saying only send out hellos on this one interface. And we pause the area ID out of the vulnerable um, OSPF config as well. Um, but nothing's happened, you know, we, we, we just identified the vuln, but we want to attack stuff. So we could, um, we could attack stuff and then you would just say um, attack, but that's boring. We've showed you that using the FortiGate. Um, we want to show you a, an inject and a redirect, which is a, a sub-command of, of attack, if I can call it that. Um, and they are similar in the terms, in the way the config templates are built um, with the inject um, flag traffic will be routed um, towards your default gateway with a redirect the traffic will stop on your endpoint which is useful maybe for a honeypot um, or if you just want to you know soak at the traffic elsewhere or do whatever you want uh, it's just a slight diff uh, difference in those two um, you'll see some activity on the rest of the screen we'll go through that shortly um, but let's just first have a look um, at the, the config templates for for the inject and the redirect um, bottom sorry at the bottom left you can see the OSPF process is going up and there we've uh, learned some routes uh, that DNS query has now changed to 1337 and uh, our FTP traffic went from three ops to four ops so what's happened what what did we create what did, you know what happened um, so if we look at um, the config template of uh, root opsy you can see there's some um, static routes at the top there going to the null interface and you might start to ask yourself why are we right, routing things towards the null interface surely we're going to drop that traffic and you can see there on our end in the Linux kernel it's also showing you know it's getting dropped but we have a way to get around that um, in the in the OSPF process we say redistribute um, and we can prove to you that it's really in, within the routing process so on the victim router you can see there quad 8 and that 164 address has been added to the routing process. Okay, so what happens if the traffic is routed towards us? Um, we make use of uh, policy-based routing, those PBR maps to take uh, care of the traffic. We don't want to, to drop it, we want to route it. So you can look at that um, policy-based map and it will match the address that we specified in our flags and the inject and uh, redirect flags. And then they're just saying forward it onto the default gateway, but for redirect, there's a natural um, forcing the traffic to stop on your endpoint, which may or may not be useful depending on your scenario. Um, you don't have to use our conflict templates. You can use your own. Um, let's log into that FTP again, um, just to prove that it's really doing something. Uh, list the directory, hop over to Wireshark, and you'll see that we've um, you know, redire redirected that FTP traffic, which is uh, pretty nifty. Okay, so that was the redirect and uh, inject flags. Um, and I just want to reiterate what we did because there was quite a bit going on. Um, we identified uh, vulnerable OSPF and EIGRP packets using the scan flag. Um, we opted out for the attack flag. We went for the inject and redirect, which implies attack. Uh, it built those config templates and it mapped it into a Docker container. Um, and we were able to... Uh, manipulate the traffic flow because we uh, influenced the, the routing table of a, a victim router that didn't have authentication applied or it was maybe configured in a way that um, it was sending out hello packets to somewhere it shouldn't have. But um, there's another attack included in the, in the toolkit which is sort of um, sub-commands of, of the redirect and, and inject flags uh, which we're calling sort of the local attacks. 
and we can manipulate traffic um, coming inbound to your local subnet, not going out of your local subnet. Um, so if you're the attacker and you find yourself on a network where there's a server, um, you know, the victim would traverse through the network and connect to the server. We can say to the OSPF or ERGRP process that we have a better route to that server and then the traffic would come to us and then um, back to the server. But this is only uh, in the incoming direction. That's not, we're not, we're not um, performing a, a full uh, person in the middle. The, the server's traffic, if the server initiates traffic to the internet or something, it's not gonna go through us first. Um, but we'll show you that it's still pretty useful. Um, and I mentioned this, um, that those blue arrows will essentially change to the red ones. Uh, if the victim connects to the server, it will come to us first and then we'll forward it onto the server and so we will respond however it, it wants to. So for this attack, we have two containers. Um, we have an inner and an outer, and the inner one is um, uh, depicted as the peer router and the outer one is depicted as rootopsy. So how this works is uh, the peer router is doing that, that um, static route that I've showed you and the redistribution. And then when, so rootopsy is configured with let's say OSPF and it's speaking OSPF to the inside, to the peer router, and it's also speaking to the, the normal network, the, the, the customer network or the victim network. Um, and then the peer root is injecting uh, a root into the process and on the root obviously on the outer container what we do is we ignore that update it propagates through the rest of the network and when the, the traffic comes back towards root obviously, um because it's supposed to go to this inner peer um, because we've um, ignored it we can process it in a way that we want to and that and that way we we do with what we want and then we send it to the server and it doesn't go back to that peer router which it was advertised to go back to. So I will show you how that looks as well. Um, slight orientation again, but hopefully you're a little bit familiar with the setup by now. Uh, it's again, top uh, left is the watch on the routing table command. Top right um, is where we'll be running uh, net grids to see if we can catch some ashes. And then the bottom left, we have the router. And the bottom right, we have a victim that's gonna connect to a share. So this victim, is obviously on the, the same network that we are on. Um, okay, so routing table, net grids, uh, we'll, run, we'll run net grids, uh, we'll log into the SMB share, um, show you that there's nothing going on, and one, then we'll run our attack again and we'll do the same thing and we'll show you the difference. So we connect to the SMB share and we do like a directory listing or something just to generate some traffic We'll log in now. Let's do uh, Alice. Okay, cool. And you can see NetGrid hasn't caught on, hasn't done anything. We haven't performed our attack as of yet. So let's uh, run our rootopsy command and see if we can manipulate that traffic flow as well. Um, and you can see now it says inject local instead of inject. Um, and then again, this implies scan, it implies attack and then the inject locals is just the variant of the, the inject attack. So we've built those config templates, you can see them there, and now it's building two containers, this inner container and this outer container. Um, and we'll have a look at their configurations as well. Uh, we'll look at the inner one first, you can see peer FRR, and once that comes on, you'll see that IP route that you're familiar with, and then that redistributes static into the process again uh, and that's pretty much all that the inner one does and then the outer one is going to do a little bit more smarter work um, in the top left you can see that we've learned we've joined the OSPF process and we've learned those routes so let's look at the outer containers um, configuration which is the template that was applied and you can see there's a little bit more going on here so from the top to the bottom you can see there's two network statements. So the one is going to the normal network and the one is going to the container. And then there are these access lists um, and the one is matching that address that we've, um, we've shared from the inner container. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply some route maps which uh, allows or denies things from your routing table. And you can see access list 10 um, is matching route map uh, entry one. So we're gonna say drop, drop uh, routing table entries for that address and then route map 2 is going to perm permit the rest of the traffic so that we don't drop all um, all the traffic and then that final IP protocol OSPF route map 
It's just ensuring that that route map is actually applied to, to OSPF. So there's a little bit more coolness happening over here. And we will now demonstrate how um, we've a uh, person in the middle, or half person in the middle, um, the incoming traffic um, from the from the victim. So let's run netcreds again now that this config has been applied. And we can see the bottom left, there's some OSPF that happened. We connect to the SMB share. And we wait for the authentication to go through. And boom, there's an NTLM v2 hash. So that's pretty cool, pretty nifty attack. Um, didn't really see those in any of the other tools, so that was quite nice. Um, yeah, just to go over it again, this is for uh, incoming traffic on your local subnet only. So it's it's quite a specific use case, but uh, nonetheless, it's pretty cool. Um, now let's go demo some of the FHRP related stuff. So the, the high availability protocols that provide that um, redundant default gateway. How do these attacks look? Um, let's do the same little bit of orientation again. Um, top left we have our uh, attacker machine uh, and then on the top on the right hand side we have the victim running a trace route and you can see this 17 hops to quad 8 and the first hop is going to 10 20 31 and that will change after we run our attack and then in the bottom left is our vulnerable HSRP router. Okay, so over there you can see the state is active on that router. The priority is 150, uh, and the, the group is 10, and there's the virtual IP that we spoke about. Um, so nothing cool yet. And we'll go over to the attacker machine, and we'll run our rootopsy command. You'll see that it'll look slightly different to the DRP-related stuff. So we're saying HSRP, and there's a count flag now, so we're saying fine how many HSRP hello packets should we be sending. And we run the attack, which again implies scan. Um, it will uh, find the vulnerable protocol, parse the config and map it to a container. The same, uh, method, the same methodology is applied here as well. So we're just waiting for that to, to kick in. Okay, there we go. Uh, you can see the state change over there. Something else has become the active HSRP device. Um, we'll have a look at that now. Okay, another state change. Okay, let's look at it again. You can now see that this device has become standby. Um, it's also the active device says 10, 20, 30, or 3. And on the trace route, you can see the first stop is now going to 3, and we have 18 ops. So traffic will go from the victim to, to us first, and then we'll route that traffic onto the original 10, 20, 31. Um, gateway address so with these attacks there's obviously some case for maybe it's not so obvious but there's there's a, a case for denial of service so with the FHRP related stuff you're uh, personally in the middle of an entire subnet on your laptop or machines network cards maybe you have 100 megs or a gigabit network card and there's 10 gigs of, of um, traffic through traversing, you know, through that network. So you gotta be a little bit careful when you're doing that. Um, there are some safeguards into built into Rootopsy, like the packet count, that type of thing. Um, but it's just, um, or maybe, you know, you haven't enabled IP forwarding and then, you know, you denial of service in entire network. But that Rootopsy does all of that um, for you, but it's just something to consider when doing these attacks with FHRPs. Um, regarding the, um, the DRPs, um, I know we said we get specific. Um, defenders can get specific again, uh, can also get specific. Um, so um, for the DRPs or HSRPs as well, really apply that authentic authentication that we mentioned, get more specific with your, your network statements. And then obviously, um, you know, you can collect syslog on these things. So it's really not that hard to configure these things correctly, just be strict. And for DRP stuff, if there's a neighbor state change, you know, you can collect syslog for that. If you have a new active device in your FHRP, you know, you can send syslog to that. Uh, maybe include that in your SIM configuration to detect these type of things. So we have something called the playground. Um, we realize that everybody doesn't have networking kits lying around to play around with these things and or um, 
familiar with network emulators, uh, we use something called EVENG quite a bit. Um, you know, if, if you're not familiar with that type of thing, you can simply um, head over to our wiki and run these YAML files with Docker Compose. And the DRP uh, file will spin up a victim, a router, uh, and then the root opsy container. And then if you run the attacks, uh, the traffic will traverse from the original path to sort of towards uh, root opsy and then back out to the normal network. Um, and then for the FHRP one, there's two VRRP containers that will be configured, a victim, and the victim will um, originally go through the VRRP uh, containers and then through the, through the traditional network. Um, and then after you run root opsy, the traffic will first be redirected towards you and then back upstream. So feel free to play around with those ones. Um, what's the takeaways of this talk? Um, network protocol security is still critical. Um, it's possible to meaningfully show impact using Rootopsy. And as I just mentioned, you know, securing and detecting doesn't look like a really hard thing to do. Um, but it doesn't seem to be the case and we've seen a lot of um, vulnerable configurations in the past. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your time. Um, if you want to have a go or play around with the tool, head over to SensePost's GitHub account. Um, you can probably reach out to me or Simon on Twitter or, um, or go on to the SensePost Twitter. Um, I'm sure you'll get hold of us <laughs> if you have any questions or you want to maybe contribute to anything. Yeah, thanks.